Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this week's National Bleeding Disorders Foundation, formerly National Hemophilia Foundation, Wednesday webinar. My name is Fiona Robinson, and I'm the series host. In today's webinar, we will learn about iron deficiency and anemia, an underappreciated complication in von Willebrand disease. We would like to extend a special thank you today to Takeda, whose generous support made this webinar possible. We encourage you to ask any questions you may have today. You can ask your questions by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen at any time during the webinar. We will monitor these questions and following the speaker's presentations, I will put your questions to them. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Friday, December 1st. Today, we are joined by two experts, Dr. Jillian Simono, pediatric hematologist and oncologist at the University of Michigan and CS Mott Children's Hospital, and Shanti Hedke, a lived experience expert with von Willebrand disease. I'd like to thank Dr. Simono and Shanti for joining us today. I'll turn things over now to Dr. Simono to get us started. Thank you, Fiona. Um, and thank you to uh, the NBDF for inviting me to give this talk. Um, and so today I will be talking about iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia in von Willebrand disease. So my objectives today um, are to discuss the prevalence of iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia in von Willebrand disease and inherited bleeding disorders review the causes of iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia in patients with von Willebrand disease, discuss the symptoms and presentation, and talk about how we diagnose and treat iron deficiency. So iron deficiency is very common. Um, it's the most common nutrient deficiency in the world. It's estimated that approximately a third of women and about a quarter of children are affected with iron deficiency anemia worldwide. Um, and roughly 10 to 20% of children just aged six months to childbearing age um, have iron deficiency. And recently, um, a study came out looking at the U.S. data and showed that about 40% of females aged 12 to 21 are iron deficient, with the majority of those um, not being anemic. So it really highlights that iron deficiency um, alone is prevalent, let alone iron deficiency that can lead to anemia. Um, and as you would suspect, suspect in patients that um, have an inherited reason that they might bleed more easier, um, iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia are more common in this population. However, current screening guidelines for the bleeding disorder population might not capture the majority of these individuals and the screening for high-risk patients that does exist lacks specificity. So what actually is iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia. Um, currently, the accepted definitions by the World Health Organization are a hemoglobin less than 12 for a female and less than 13 for a male. And then iron deficiency is diagnosed when ferritin is either less than 15 or less than 30, um, kind of depending on what citation you read. Um, but I think the most recent and what I like to use is physiological um, physiology-based data that suggests a cutoff of 20 for children and 25 for non-pregnant women. Um, and then, you know, together, if you um, both have anemia and a low ferritin, that would be iron deficiency anemia. And again, I want to highlight that iron deficiency can be, you know, a diagnosis alone without anemia. And so um, how common is iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia in von Willebrand disease? Again, the, the prevalence of this is not, you know, highly studied or um, the literature around this is not robust, um, but there are two studies um, or, you know, pretty robust studies, one based in Canada and then another a systematic review that suggests anemia is, in females is roughly 13 to 20 percent with iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia being just higher, a little bit higher than that. And then in males, about four and a half percent of males with von Willebrand disease are iron deficient, and just about the same are iron um, deficient with anemia. 
And I think thinking back to the last slide and seeing that the prevalence um, in the US population is higher than these numbers, um, I think that the prevalence in the abominable brain disease population is even higher than these figures here, just because screening is not common practice. And then thinking of iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia and inherited bleeding disorders as a whole, again, the risk and prevalence in this population is not well studied. It's probably higher than what is reported due to the inherited risk of bleeding. We know that women um, of childbearing age are at the highest risk due to monthly menstruation um, and increased iron need in pregnancy. Um, and there's really not any formal recommendations outside of people with menorrhagia of when and how to screen in inherited bleeding disorders. Um, there has been one, or there was one study, um, a case report from the ISTH Congress last year that looked at iron deficiency anemia in patients with hemophilia A and B, which showed that roughly 80% had iron deficiency and 74% had iron deficiency anemia. And so I think, you know, those numbers are much higher than what was presented just in the von Willebrand disease population. And um, I think we have some work to do and kind of better identifying our patients with von Willebrand disease who have iron deficiency and anemia. And so what, you know, what causes iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia and von Willebrand disease? Um, I'm mainly gonna focus on bleeding manifestations. I think talking about nutritional deficiency you know, it's not the focus of this talk, but that could always be a contributing source. But for um, the population that is at an inherited risk of bleeding, you know, bleeding is a is the main cause of iron deficiency and anemia. And so the majority is um, secondary to heavy menstrual bleeding, um, also oral mucosal bleeding, nose bleeds, GI bleeding, and then more rare, um, but we do see it in vomal brain disease occasionally would be joint bleeding. Uh, So von Willebrand disease is actually the most um, common bleeding disorder associated with heavy menstrual bleeding. And as you can see, heavy menstrual bleeding affects roughly 75% or more of women with von Willebrand disease. Um, and the von Willebrand disease impact on health reported quality of life is most pronounced, um, or the impact of von Willebrand disease on reported um, quality of life in patients is most pronounced in those that have heavy menstrual bleeding. And the symptoms are often, <clears throat> excuse me, unrecognized and inadequately treated. Roughly four out of 10 women seek care for heavy menstrual bleeding and less than 10% of providers or primary care providers have been noted to document menstrual history in, um, in their notes which can lead to a significant reduction in quality of life and ongoing symptoms if this isn't recognized. You know, if iron deficiency is not treated, it can lead to anemia and that further negatively impacts um, health reported quality of life measures. Um, a big reason why this goes unrecognized is because individuals, individuals gauge their vaginal bleeding or the normalcy of their vaginal bleeding compared to their family members. And so if a teenager who experienced teenager or adolescent who experiences menarche has heavy menstrual bleeding, but it's the same as her mom or her aunts or her grandmother, um, neither her or, her, you know, her caregivers are going to identify that as abnormal. And so I think it's on us as providers to, you know, do a better job at screening in this population. What is heavy menstrual bleeding? Um, formally, it is the loss of roughly 80 milliliters of blood in one week's time. But more recently, it's been defined as heavy bleeding affecting quality of life. And so red flags that I ask for are if your flow is lasting longer than seven days, are you leaking into your clothing and or sheets? Um, and with that, I like to ask often about the feeling of a gush of blood too when um, people stand up. That could be a red flag. You need to change hygiene products more frequently and then every one to two hours or passing large blood clots. So, you know, why does this matter? Well, iron deficiency matters because if it's not treated, it can eventually lead to anemia, but it also matters because it can cause significant physical and cognitive symptoms. Um, poor concentration, fatigue, um, inability to, you know, perform in athletic 
performances as much as um, people want to decrease quality of life. We've, we've talked about that. And both iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia are well reported in the literature to be associated with adverse outcomes, um, especially in that health related quality of life um, aspect, which is really what it's been used, um, what's been measured in, in literature reports. So symptoms of iron deficiency, you know, I think we, most of us are familiar with some of them, um, like you know, mental fatigue, paleness, <clears throat> craving non-iron foods, shortness of breath, cold intolerance, but some other ones that I don't think we often think about are, you know, having a sore tongue or mouth ulcers, investigating people's nails on physical exam. Are they brittle? Do they chip and crack easily? All of these are signs and symptoms of iron deficiency and, and anemia. How do we diagnose iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia? So first thing is a history, asking about those symptoms on the previous slide, <clears throat> you know, potentially even checking orthostatic blood pressures if someone is, you know, severely anemic. And then a lab investigation, so getting blood counts, checking a hemoglobin, looking at the size of the red blood cell, looking at a reticulocyte count. And then getting iron studies, so looking at a serum iron, a total iron binding capacity, the transferrin saturation, and ferritin levels. And I'll talk about this for a second because I think interpretation of iron studies can be tricky at times. Um, a TABC, or the total iron binding capacity, really reflects the availability of iron binding on transferrin, which is the principal transport iron um, in plasma or iron transport protein in plasma. And so um, the transferrin or the, and then transferrin saturation, which also is kind of reported when you order this lab or it, it is in my institution, um, is calculated from the serum iron and the total iron binding capacity. And serum iron um, is affected by multiple different variables, dietary intake on the day the lab was drawn, sometimes the time of day, and then the um, TIBC can be affected by pregnancy, oral contraceptive use, um, chronic illness. And so uh, both of those using the TIBC and the transferrin saturation can sometimes not be very specific um, for iron deficiency. And then low ferritin, so ferritin is like the body's stores of iron. And so low ferritin, um, is highly specific for iron deficiency, but it's also an acute phase reactant. And so um, a normal ferritin doesn't rule out iron deficiency. This is why I included some additional labs to consider. Um, if available, sometimes we use a soluble transferrin receptor to differentiate that, you know, that is not gonna be affected by inflammation. So sometimes if you have a high suspicion for iron deficiency in a patient whose ferritin is normal or even slightly, you know, above where you think it might be, um, getting the soluble transferrin receptor can help. And I always like to rule out any underlying thyroid disease and in investigating for iron deficiency as well. And then, you know, how do we make this diagnosis and when should we check the screening recommendations? Like I had mentioned are um, a little vague. Um, in one systematic review that looked at screening for anemia and people with heavy menstrual bleeding, <clears throat> Roughly half of the studies in that review didn't recommend getting iron studies. Um, and then the North American Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology recommends a CBC and ferritin just for adolescent girls. The AAP, the Pediatric Society, recommends screening for iron deficiency in adolescent females at high risk, but doesn't really characterize who that population is. Um, and then the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis also recommends that patients with heavy menstrual bleeding should be regularly assessed and treated, um, but there aren't further specific directions on when that assessment should be. So how do we manage iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia in the bowel brain disease population? You can see kind of central to the treatment would be replacing iron um, and giving iron supplements. But then also stopping the underlying cause, so stopping the bleeding, whether that's menstrual cessation, using topical hemostatic agents, antifibrinolytics, or replacing vomal brand factor and increasing your vomal brand factor um, levels. 
We know that iron treatment improves health health related quality of life. There's good literature to suggest that iron um, supplements can lead to cognitive benefits. Oral iron is low cost, it's widely accessible, it's overall well tolerated, but there are IV preparations that are available and use of IV iron is um, anecdotally uh, increasing, at least in our institution. <clears throat> so speaking, you know, just on replacing iron, you know, from a dietary standpoint, um, the human iron demand is roughly 20 to 25 milligrams a day. And we, you know, we take in about one milligram in our diet a day and roughly 90% of the other daily requirement of our iron is from recycled red blood cells in our body. Um, and so here on the right, you can see the American Red Cross, kind of a hierarchy of foods that are high in iron. Um, we know that heme iron present in meats is more bioavailable than non-heme iron, which is, you know, more found in our vegetables. And then one thing we do talk about in our clinic is the lucky iron fish. I don't know if people have experience with this, but it is a literal iron fish that you can get on Amazon um, that kind of releases iron into whatever foods you might be cooking. Um, and although the studies didn't show, you know, statistically significant improvements um, in iron parameters did show improvement in anemia in the study population when used correctly. And so <clears throat> I never think it's bad to talk about using the iron fish. Um, when we talk about oral iron medications, we know that um, iron supplements are efficacious. Um, we recommend an iron dose of elemental iron greater than 60 milligrams every other day. You know, that's based off of the Lancet study from a few years ago, and there have been subsequent studies that show that every other day iron can lead to similar efficacy and absorption um, and hopefully minimize side effects. And then in the pediatric population, which I work with a lot, you know, iron tablets aren't as feasible, so we do use liquid iron. Um, Nova Ferrum, don't receive anything from the company, but um, for my own kids, I use Nova Ferrum and um, find that the flavors are much more palatable than um, some other liquid formulations. Um, because, you know, oral iron can come with some pretty significant um, side effects roughly 30 to 70% of people taking oral iron have reduced compliance due to the side effects. So things like nausea, constipation, um, some vomiting or metallic, they just don't like the taste of the iron. Um, and then having dark stools can sometimes make people nervous. And so all of those reasons are why people might not be compliant with their medications. You can see on the right, we have the, you know, the most commonly used iron salts, various, um, Oops, that says sucrose, it's meant to say um, ferrous sulfate, ferrous gluconate, ferrous fumarate. Um, those are all in general tolerated the same. There might be some literature to suggest ferrous fumarate has a little bit more GI side effects than the other two, but roughly the literature is kind of says that they all have the similar side effect profile. <clears throat> um, polysaccharide iron and heme iron polypeptide are additional formulations not, you know, iron salt based. They don't rely on an acidic environment to improve their absorption. They are a little bit more expensive. And I think at least for the pediatric population have not shown as significant improvements in um, iron parameters as the iron salts, but they are still good options if um, the iron salts aren't tolerated. And what should you expect, um, you know, when treating someone with iron, you should see an improved reticulocyte count in roughly four to five days, some improvements in hemoglobin by about two weeks, but it can take a full three to six months to see kind of complete improvement in hemoglobin and have the iron stores of that ferritin number um, return to a range that we, that we would think would be normal. <clears throat> And just a note on, you know, taking oral iron, we often, you know, it's best to be separated aside from food because there's a lot that can affect the absorption. So often advising patients to take between meals or, you know, before bed, after a meal, prior to breakfast, which can be hard for people. Um, and we know that vitamin C low doses are 
think doses of vitamin C can help aid in absorption. And then things that we want to avoid when giving oral iron would be any like medications that reduce gastric acid, so PPI or, or an H2 blocker, and then things like dairy, tea, coffee, caffeine, um, those are all known to uh, help decrease absorption. <clears throat> Just a note on intravenous preparations, because I think, you know, there's been historically a lot of negative associations with IV iron that I think now we have more and more data to suggest that we can use them or the new formulations are uh, more safe. And so IV preparations can be indicated if you have someone who fails to improve on oral iron, um, has malabsorption um, from a you know, GI condition, if someone has you know, severe blood loss and we need to rapidly replace their iron stores or in chronic renal disease, um, high molecular weight iron not, you know, has been taken off the market due to the severe um, reactions associated with the infusion. But there are now multiple formulations with a lower severe adverse event risk. And although infusion reactions can occur, there's you know, published guidelines on how to manage those infusion or hypersensitivity reactions. And so I think you know, if you have a patient that isn't responding, um, attempting to use or, uh, intravenous iron can be a good option. So just summarizing, you know, oral iron is low cost, it's easy access, it doesn't require an infusion visit or the nursing staff to observe for set infusion reactions. Um, it does come with GI side effects that the intravenous route tends to minimize um, and does require <clears throat> a fair amount of compliance. But on the kind of the downside is that it can take some time to fully correct um, the anemia. So aside from oral iron or iron supplement, how else can we manage um, iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia in the vomal brand population? And I think just thinking first about menorrhagia, you know, um, I think a lot of people use a combined approach. I like using a combined approach of both hormonal treatment. So, you know, pills, implants, IUDs, or a copper IUD, the non-hormone IUD, along with antifibrinolytics can be really successful. Um, or use just using antifibrinolytics during the time of menses um, in someone that is additionally using hormone treatment is a combination I have found to be really successful. Um, I would advocate if you're able to work with adolescent or your adult gynecology colleagues to kind of help manage more of the hormonal piece um, that has um, been really successful uh, in our setting. Um, and I know there have been previous concerns about using um, antifibrinolytics in patients uh, with OCPs and um, you know, the black box warning, but um, there have been a good amount of, or there have been research to show that it is safe to use them combined. So using like a TXA or Amacar with the uh, oral combined contraceptives. And bleeding other than menorrhagia, um, so such as nosebleeds or people with significant GI bleeding, you know, really utilizing your antifibrinolytics topical hemostatic agents such as bleed seas for um, epistaxis, um, using DDAVP, now that hopefully the intranasal forms are back available, and then um, replacing with um, Wilbrand factor. And so, <clears throat> in a, you know, one study reported roughly 5 to 20% of women with von Wilbrand disease are using von Wilbrand factor prophylaxis. Um, but the current, um, you know, most recent 2021 guidelines on the treatment of bone brain disease do recommend long-term prophylaxis for patients with a history of severe and frequent bleeds. But I think we're lacking um, studies that look at kind of the long-term use of um, bone factor prophylaxis and how that affects overall quality of life in that population. In summary, um, iron deficiency and its um, associated anemia are very prevalent, under-recognized and under-treated, especially um, in our patients with inherited bleeding disorders and you know, like Bamulibrand disease. We could benefit from better guidance on screening and treating patients um, with inherited bleeding disorders because we know that early treatment of iron deficiency can help prevent that associated anemia. 
And that treatment um, in our Wamala brand patients involves both replenishing iron stores and slowing the bleeding. So with that, um, I will end uh, my presentation and pass it over to Shanti. Hi, my name is Shanti. Um, I am a member of NYLI who has type 1 von Willebrand's disease. Um, and NYLI is um, a youth program, um, part of the NBDF uh, foundation that helps like empower um, and provide leadership opportunities for youth with bleeding disorders. Um, and my bleeding disorder journey um, kind of started at the age of 19. Uh, so actually last year when I was diagnosed with um, type 1 von Willebrand's disease and um, although I'm pretty new to the community, it's been a long journey and I'm really excited to be here and talk to you guys about uh, my own journey, uh, not only with von Willebrand's disease, but also with iron deficiency anemia. So Chanti, tell us a little bit more about your path of diagnosis. So you mentioned before you um, received your diagnosis when you were 19, but tell us a little bit more how you got to that point. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I was diagnosed at the age of 19, but I had been bleeding since I was around like 14, 15, uh, right about when I started uh like a little bit before when I started and getting my periods, I kind of started with like having nosebleeds and bruising. But then right when I started my periods, I would have my periods for a really long time. Um, for instance, um, I had like one of my periods in high school lasted for six months. Um, and so I was seeing an OBGYN for that. And um, a lot of the times it was kind of dismissed as oh, that's just normal. Girls kind of bleed like that. It's just normal. Um, and it's kind of like over time, it was just continued. Um, this is just normal for women and girls to bleed like this. But it wasn't until um, I moved to Boston for college where um, it got a lot worse. Um, I was bruising a lot more. I was having more frequent nosebleeds um, with like immunizations. Uh, the bleeding wouldn't stop. For example, I got my flu shot and um, right after my bleeding wouldn't stop. Um, and so around this time, I had started my freshman year of college and I had my period for about um, seven months. And it was right around the time where I was supposed to move out of my dorm, where I was bleeding so much that I uh, had to change my tampon every 30 minutes and I was bleeding through my underwear, um, even with like the heaviest tampon on. Um, and I was feeling really lightheaded and I felt like I couldn't really move. Um, I remember calling my mom, um, because I was moving out alone being like, I need to be seen at an emergency room or I need to be seen by a gynecologist because this just, just didn't feel normal. So I had gotten a gynecology appointment um, the next week and I had mentioned, you know, I had been bleeding for so long. Um, my gynecologist um, back at home had said I just had endometriosis. It's normal, but I had gotten the surgery and they said I didn't really have endometriosis. Um, and so I had just continued to bleed and bleed to the point where I was anemic. Um, and she had mentioned there's something called von Willebrand's disease um, and I got tested and turns out I had type one von Willebrand's disease, um, which was also around the time where um, I started getting GI bleeding as well. So um, I was really happy to finally find a cause for um, all of my bleeding. And um, I started to, to seek the treatment of a hematologist up in Boston. Um, but my story kind of just didn't end there. I ended up um, trying desmopressin and I actually anaphylaxed to desmopressin, so I couldn't take DDAVP. And then I 
ended up having like adverse reactions to both um, amicar and transexamic acid. I would throw up so much that I would feel so sick that I would like be losing some of my weight um, and I would be having diarrhea and I would also be having bloody diarrhea along with that. So I um, ended up talking to my hematologist who um, finally got me on Humate P, uh, which is factor for, um, that has both factor and von Willebrand's factor for uh, von Willebrand's disease. And that turned out to be a really great option. And um, yeah, it helps a lot. And um, I've been kind of considering taking it um, on a more regular basis because I have my periods for like six months um, that don't really stop and go continuously. So um, definitely like finding the right option for you and advocating for myself has been a really big part of my journey. Sorry, Shanti, my um, audio wasn't working, but I have it on my phone now. So thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I think, you know, one of the questions was, what was your pathway to diagnosis like? And it sounded like it was prolonged um, and required a lot of, you know, self-advocating. So, you know, how did you find that experience to be and like, you know, what were some of the barriers to like that you that you came across? Yeah, I think being a young adult is really hard because you're transitioning from having a pediatrician and kind of I kind of relied on my parents a lot um, back in high school for my health care and uh, transitioning to college and really, you know, being by yourself, especially in a big city and not really having your parents and also like being transitioned into the adult clinics um, was really hard for me. Um, I was seeing different doctors in a completely different city. Um, I didn't really have an established primary care physician around the time that I was diagnosed. Um, so that was increasingly hard to, you know, like get in contact with like a new OBGYN um, and start the process here. So I think that was like one of my biggest barriers, um, but also also kind of overcoming the barrier of this is normal. Um, for me, I knew that wasn't normal because I was feeling so exhausted. So I definitely um, had to, you know, step in and be like, this isn't normal for me. This isn't just, you know, what happens every day. And I really would like to be taken seriously. Um, and, you know, sometimes as young adults, we may not be taken seriously. And uh, that's something that I saw every time I went to another gynecologist who kept telling me that it was just normal um, and told me I needed to do physical therapy instead. Um, and so just really like advocating for myself and saying like, putting my foot down and saying like, this isn't normal. I really want to um, seek treatment for it. And I really want to see like what my options are. Um, and I was really thankful that I had a great team of doctors here in Boston. Uh, my hematologist has been amazing um, helping me out. And uh, for all of my drug allergies, I also see like an immunologist who works with my hematologist. So that has been really amazing. And right after my desmopressin anaphylaxis, really um, just like reaching out to my doctor and like asking her like, what are my options? Um, just because like, I knew I couldn't take that. And like, there's some other drugs that um, I have adverse reactions to. So really just making sure I'm always like voicing my concern to my care team um, and, you know, making sure they know what's going on and that if I'm not on board with something, just making sure that I voice that so we can come up with um, a solution together. Yeah. Wow. Um, I mean, you're just like a model advocate for hopefully most of our patients. So I'm so glad that you're so involved in that. Um, MBDF too. Um, and maybe, you know, I have a couple more questions, but maybe you can talk about your experience um, in that role too in a little bit. Um, and it sounds like, so just talking, you know, about how to stop your bleeding sounds like was a, you know, a lot of trial and error. And now we have a system that's potentially working, although it took a lot of advocating. Um, and talk a little bit about your iron deficiency and how, you know, not only the bleeding, but the effects of iron deficiency have impacted your life and kind of how you're managing your iron deficiency now if you're doing anything other than um, you know, stopping the bleeding. Yeah, definitely. So iron deficiency has had like a huge impact on my bleeding just because I bleed so much. Um, and I'm also a vegetarian. So, you know, like some of um, my diet has also like has affected my iron intake. Um, so 
that has definitely factored into having pretty low iron. Um, but I have been pretty much iron deficient since I started my periods, um, just because I would bleed so much. And I remember in high school, I would take iron supplements, but they wouldn't really help that much. Um, I would feel nauseous on them, but it wasn't terrible where I stopped taking them. Um, but it didn't really help that much in my iron. Uh, when they did the iron binding blood test, it was still pretty low. Um, and I, when I came into college, I was very, very fatigued. Um, there were days where I just didn't feel like I could go to class or I couldn't concentrate. Um, I would be like very thirsty. I would chew on ice. Um, and then I got my blood taken and they saw that I had, um, microcytic anemia. So that showed um, evidence of iron deficiency. And then they also did some iron deficiency tests. And I believe that um, they were in the low teens. So that I had evidence of iron deficiency. And just because I was bleeding so much um, throughout the year, um, they wanted to address it. So I started off by taking iron tablets um, right when I got diagnosed. But I was also ha having GI bleeding. Um, and I guess it decreased my absorption. Um, I was also kind of going through some like GI problems at the time and I wasn't really absorbing the iron every time they did the test. It um, kind of stayed the same and I was still bleeding heavily and it really wasn't stopping the bleed that much. Um, and so I was considering taking IV iron, um, but given my history with um with like all these allergies, I definitely had to um, be careful just because I'm also allergic to Benadryl. And so having Benadryl with IV iron wasn't an option um, just because I was allergic to the medication that was supposed to help with the allergy. So um, kind of being on a steroid course and kind of like really working with my hematologist and immunologist to see when was the correct time for me to get IV iron. Um, and like help with that. I'm still actually in the process of doing that. Um, right now I'm taking, um, factor. Um, I just had my first dose of like self infusing pretty recently. Um, and that has been helping a little bit, but I'm still in the process of figuring out my iron deficiency. Um, just because I have some like pretty, um, I have had like allergic reactions in the past. So, you know, working with my um, doctor to see if like uh, a steroid course before is an option um, or kind of doing like a little bit, like a low dose testing of iron and then seeing if I have a reaction to that and then um, continuing different types of iron medications because I know there's six infusion medications. Um, so if it's not like Farahim, it could be another IV infusion medication. So definitely um, I've been in contact with my hematologist and immunologist and we've been like working on um working on getting um, iron deficiency anemia treatment for me. Wow, um, that is a lot to kind of navigate um, and navigate not, you know, not alone. It sounds like you have a very supportive team, but kind of, you know, I'm sure you've done trying to do your own research and also, you know, while trying to manage your symptoms, you said um, you've now just first self-infused. Do you want to talk about the process of learning that or trying to do that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess it was very scary, like the first time around um, doing that, just because I had never done that before on myself. Um, I've seen it uh, done on other people or like other people have taken my blood. Um, and I've actually done it on other people, but I have not done it on myself. So it was very scary. Um, but it was really cool to see that I could do it myself and that um, I like if, for instance, I went home for the holidays and had to bleed, I could just treat myself instead of, you know, going to the emergency room or going to the, my doctor. Um, it just made the process so much easier so I could, you know, be prepared for events like emergencies or potential bleeds. So um, it was really, really cool to learn. It was also very empowering to just, you know, be able to, you know, like take healthcare into my own hands and um, infuse myself. Uh, I thought that was really cool and also a really good skill too, um, especially if you're like in an emergency setting. Um, but as a pre-medicine student myself, I thought it was a really good skill to know, but also really empowering to do it on myself and be able to treat myself and kind of like learn the biology behind everything. 
<clears throat> Definitely that, I mean, that is a, something really to be proud of. I think I, like you said it the best, it's very empowering to be able to, you know, kind of feel like for, you know, after so many barriers that you've been met with in treating your vulnerable brain disease, that you have something that you can, you know, kind of control yourself. And um, I think that that's really inspiring. Do you want to talk for a minute about your involvement with the NYLI? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's been such a great group of um, young adults who have bleeding disorders as well. Um, it's been such an empowering experience just because I was diagnosed just last year and I knew no one my age. I also didn't know anyone, period. My parents don't have a bleeding disorder and I don't have anyone in my family that does. So um, just like being able to meet young adults who have bleeding disorders and being able to like talk about my experience as well as um, their experiences has been like really empowering. I remember going to my first BDC um, this past August and sitting on um, the, I was actually managing a Von Willebrand's disease um, session. And it was just so cool to see the new treatment options, to hear from providers um, and just be part of a community that, um, is just always empowering and uplifting each other. When I first joined NYLI, like I immediately clicked with um, my like fellow members who are in it. And we talked about how we were diagnosed and um, we were talking about, I was actually talking with one of the other girls who has Bob Willebrand's disease, her own diagnosis story. And we actually exchanged um, information and she kind of motivated me to um, advocate for myself with my own doctor because um, I actually didn't know I could have a social worker or a physical therapist as a Von Willebrand's disease patient. And so just like hearing from others um, about their own experiences, being in such an empowering group of young adults. Um, and it's just such a fun experience. And I actually got to go um, to the NOW conference um, for those with von Willebrand's disease. And it was just so cool because I actually ended up sitting in an iron deficiency um, a session on iron deficiency anemia there. And I learned so much about what I can take back to my own hematologist and meet just like everyone in the United States who has von Willebrand's disease. It was just a group of those who have von Willebrand's disease and it was so great. And also having opportunities to go um, advocate on a federal level was amazing. Um, and like we actually, a, a few of us NYLI members ended up going to a fly-in um, on the Capitol Hill. And that was my first time ever advocating for um, bleeding disorders. And it was just so empowering. I got to tell my stories to my story to um, a federal member um, who worked as a health legislative aide in the Georgia and Massachusetts offices. And just like being able to share my story and advocate for those who have Von Willebrand's disease. Um, I know like some types of Von Willebrand's disease are like milder, but there's also severe. So like being able to advocate for all types of Von Willebrand's disease and like make sure that even the mild, milder ones matter as well was just so empowering. And um, it really like, it's just, it's been a year, but it's really been such an exciting year since I've um, got diagnosed. Um, it sounds like it. And it sounds like the NYLI has just been, you know, an incredible resource. And um, thank you for, you know, continuing to share your story and advocate for patients like yourself. And I'm sure, you know, the impact that the people you've met have had on you, you know, you're giving that back to other members as well. Um, it's, um, really remarkable to have you share your experience today. Um, Thank is there so anything much. else you wanted to share or we can pass it back to Fiona? Um, I guess I just wanted to thank everyone for being here today, um, and giving me the chance to share my story. Um, and it's, it was great meeting all of you. Um, and also is having a platform to share my story has been incredible, um, it's definitely been a whirlwind of a year, um, but I want to continue advocating for anyone that has a bleeding disorder, including von Willebrand's disease. Um, and yeah, the NYLI program has been such a great opportunity to do that, but also opportunity for young adults to have a voice in the community as well. 
Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you again for sharing your story. I feel like stories and hearing and, you know, talking to people like you would just inspire me to continue to want to do better for our patients too. Thank you very much, Santhi and Dr. Simono. That was really a really insightful presentation and discussion. It's been really great to, to hear from both of you. Um, we'll go ahead now with our live Q&A. Just a reminder to our audience, if you have a question for our guest today, please enter it in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to answer all of your questions. Um, let's see, we can maybe start with... We've had a question from an audience member asking if you can tell us a bit more about the program that you're involved with and how you got involved. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the program is called National Youth Leadership Institute, part of NBDF, um, and it's for young adults um, ages 18 to 24 um, who have bleeding disorders or who have immediate family members like siblings or parents who have bleeding disorders um, to kind of just help them become leaders in the community. Um, for instance, you know, helping us with public speaking or, you know, really like sharing our story or like giving us a platform to share our story um, and having just a group of us, you know, come together and learn more from each other, um, which has been such an empowering experience. Um, our onboarding, um, we actually got to, you know, do resume workshops um, and have guest speakers. We got to see the um, Nebraska chapter, which was really cool and got to engage with chapter members, um, not only providing us a platform for um, talking about our own bleeding disorders, but also hearing from other people um, and talking to community members, which has been such a great experience. Um, and so it just really helps us become leaders. So um, I think the application cycle is opening pretty soon. So definitely I encourage anyone to apply. I found out about it where, right around the time I got diagnosed and I was so excited to apply because I was like, this is such a great way for me to finally find young adults or at least someone um, I know, at least I will know that has a bleeding disorder. And so I encourage everyone to apply. It's such an amazing opportunity um, and applications open up if you search up NYLI and BDF. Um, it's actually on the website. Um, and so it's an incredible opportunity. So I encourage everyone to apply. Super. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, maybe I can continue with asking you for, for advice for any other young person in the bleeding disorders community. Uh, I know you're, you've really recommended uh, getting involved with uh, your local patient organization and, and, and YLI. Do you have any other advice in terms of, you mentioned it could be quite a struggle for a young adult, um, you may be interacting with the healthcare system. Do you have any advice on, on sort of how to advocate for yourself, how to be heard, how to stay strong when you're not being heard? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I was, it was definitely very hard. As I mentioned, I was diagnosed like at 19 and I was in college. Um, so really making sure I kind of like searched, like was on the internet, um, searching up, you know, like what does even Von Willebrand sees mean? Or I remember when I first heard the term, I was like, Von Willow, what? I was so, I was like, this is, this is so confusing. I don't even know how to navigate it. Plus I'm in classes. Um, plus I have friends kind of like, um, just like figuring out how to like put that in my life, um, and kind of like navigate that, um, was just like definitely a struggle, but I think NBDF's resources were definitely very helpful. I remember when I was like first trying to get like insurance approval, um, for DDAVP to, you know, for in my insurance to cover it. That's something that I was like working with my parents, like from my, I'm from Georgia, but I go to school in Boston. So that's also like, um, a, a, a long ways away from home. Um, and I was working with my parents on like doing that and definitely like really like finding resources online to help me. Um, I remember like looking up Von Willebrand's disease and the first thing that came up was the NBDF website, kind of looking through um, resources that NBDF provided me. And then I reached out to actually my local chapter here in Massachusetts to Neha. And I first had a conversation with um, one of their um, chapter member, chapter uh, higher board people, and they um, 
had other people who they know ha- who had von Willebrand's disease that they were willing to put me in contact with, which was really exciting. Um, so that was like the first thing I did right like a month after I got um, diagnosed was talking with them because that that was just like very inspiring to me that there was other people who, out there who had it who were willing to talk to me. Um, definitely like getting in touch with your chapter, especially if you're in another state, they're more than happy to talk to you. Um, and I think another thing is like kind of reading up more about the, um, like Von Wilbur's disease online. And also when I went into the doctor's appointment, I would ask as many questions as possible. Sometimes I was afraid to ask questions because I thought they were dumb questions, but no questions are dumb at all. Um, I would really, really ask like what everything meant and what all my treatment options were um, just because I was a little bit more of a complicated case. So I really wanted to like really put everything on the table and see like, why can't I do this? Why can't I do this? Like, what are my treatment options to really um, make sure that I was heard and they, and I was comfortable with getting these treatments. Super. Thanks very much for that. And you've clearly become quite an expert on all of this. So you're, all of your questions have paid off and all of your research has paid off. Um, maybe I can put this question first to Dr. Simono, and then we'll, maybe we'll see if you want to chime in as well, Shanti. Um, can you tell us a little bit about maybe mental health aspects of iron deficiency and whether iron replacement um, can be beneficial for improving some psychological outcomes? Um, yes, it can. Um, I, I'm i not as, you know, I know there's literature out there to suggest that even improving iron deficiency, if you're not anemic, can lead to improved, you know, cognition or perceived cognition, like, you know, improvement in fatigue. Um, and so as a provider, I really try, you know, even if someone has like a somewhat low ferritin or somewhat borderline iron stores that is reporting, you know, difficulty with school or not concentrating, you know, I really try and um, empathize with them about those symptoms and take them seriously because we do know that, um, you know, you can have these real, you um, cognitive and physical effects of iron deficiency, even if um, your ferritin levels are not that low and your hemoglobin is normal. Great, thank you for that. Shanti, did you have any uh, any reflections on that yourself? Yeah, I think I definitely agree. That's like kind of happened to me before when I uh, my iron levels were pretty low. Um, I would definitely feel extremely exhausted, hard to concentrate. Um, and I know, as I mentioned, I went to the now conference and one of the providers was mentioning even depression can be a side effect of having, um, low iron levels. And so it's definitely true. And especially as like a young adult, when you're in college, it's very hard to navigate, um, being exhausted all the time and also having classes and then focusing on your exams and then doing well um, is definitely hard. So I'm really thankful that I've been able to get treatment for that. I've been continuing to get treatment for that. And I really encourage everyone who's struggling with, um, you know, like feeling really down or feeling really like exhausted, um, not able to like move, like your bones feel really achy. I think that was like a, the biggest part was like my joints and bones would feel really, really achy, kind of like the restless leg syndrome um, type achy. And I would just not be able to concentrate on exams. And so I really encourage to, you know, advocate for yourself and really make sure you're heard to your providers and say, I'm not feeling well. Um, I'm really, really not feeling well. And I would really like to uh, consider if not oral iron is not working for you, um, iron infusions. Great. That's actually a fantastic segue. We're going to try and squeeze one last question into Dr. Simono. Um, somebody was asking if, if you're struggling with those oral iron supplements, how can you advocate for an IV approach uh, to iron supplementation? Is that, is that something that somebody with uh, anemia or iron deficiency can talk to their health? How, how could they approach that? Uh, yeah, from a patient perspective, you know, I think it's um, hard, you know, there's many ways to try and document compliance to show your provider that you're taking the iron. Um, but at the same time, if you're really struggling with, with side effects, I think being honest about your symptoms um, and continuing to advocate that, you know, the symptoms are not tolerable for you um, and asking your provider to look into 
um, insurance approval of IV iron, which um, historically, you know, there are some barriers or have been. Um, I've been having more luck lately, you know, just documenting in my own documentation. So from a provider standpoint, you know, being sure to document that the patient has not tolerated oral iron um, and is, you know, experiencing ongoing symptoms that I attribute to iron deficiency or iron deficiency anemia. And that I, you know, recommend that they be treated with an intravenous formulation. And it might take, you know, it might not, might not be one, the first infusion that you try that gets approved, but trying a different formulation. And, you know, I think that's when it comes to the provider's turn to be an advocate for the patient to try and um, try and get different formulations approved. Great. Thank you very much for that. Thank you both very much for answering all of those questions. I feel like we could keep talking about this for, for ages, um, but we unfortunately do have to move on now. We are going to wrap up our Q&A session with some questions for our audience. And we've just launched a poll there, so you should see three questions coming up. Um, and these are anonymous polling questions. And we would really like to ask all of our audience members to fill those out and give us their thoughts. And do note that it is uh, this data is collected anonymously. Um, as we give everyone a few minutes to answer the polling questions, I'd really like to thank Dr. Jillian Simono and Shanti Edgate for sharing your expertise and your time with us this afternoon. Uh, I'd also like to thank each of you in our audience for joining us. This recorded webinar will be available on Friday, December 1st at hemophilia.org under the events tab. If you select past events, you'll find all of our archived webinars there. Also available in the events tab is the schedule of upcoming webinars in this series. Join us next week for another rare treat as we go behind the scenes to learn about healthcare providers in the ultra rare bleeding disorders community. So thank you all very much for joining this afternoon and wish you an excellent week. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Great to meet you, Shanti. Nice to meet you too.